Arizona water use and farming cultures. Uh, I think most of my titles are at the, uh, at the top of the screen, so we'll try that. Um, and I want to tell you right now, I have been a historian, an academic historian, uh, probably 40 years researching and, and student teaching, but I've really gotten out of the academic part of it. And when I wrote for uh, Rio Nueva Publishers, which I've done for the last 10 years and am on furlough right now, um, I got more into writing for uh, souvenir books, tourist books, that sort of thing. So it's more of a general public. I don't have to be peer reviewed. I don't have to have a whole list of citations at the bottom of every page. So a lot of times I'm writing about things where I'm not exactly an expert in that field. And so I've kind of come up with this thing you know, I, I write about glaciers, I write about why sandstone is red, all kinds of stuff like that. And uh, when, when I get into the archaeology and the anthropology part, I have interviewed and, uh, and written a lot of archaeological kind of stuff, but I like to paraphrase Star Trek, damn it, Jim, I'm a science writer, not an archaeologist. And so you'll have to take it with a grain of salt that I, I have done my research, but uh, there may be some things that have come up in the last six months or two years or whatever that have uh, changed the numbers. And, uh, and I've run across that. I'm doing a second edition of my Arizona book right now. And I had to change some of the stuff that I wrote in the first edition because uh, they have made new discoveries. And, uh, and that, is gets me right into the mammoth hunters. Uh, I like to do my, my presentations like James Michener writes his novels, which is he starts with a spinning ball of molten lava and then brings it up to the continents and the oceans are formed and all of that stuff. But we're in luck tonight. We're only going back to 13,000 BC to the uh, mammoth hunters of the uh, late Pleistocene Pleistocene started two, two million years ago, and giant glaciers covered the northern hemisphere. And the Sonoran Desert, south of, well, Phoenix and south, uh, basically was carpeted with ponderosa pine, alligator juniper, uh, things that you'd find at a higher elevation now. And the annual rainfall in the lowlands was more than 40 inches, about what Iowa gets now, and Arizona, I believe, gets eight inches usually annually. So the weather was a lot different, but around 13,000 BC, it started to warm. The glaciers were receding. So we had the climate change, and that's what Norm was, was uh, kind of focusing on with this, and that's what I've tried to do as well with the whole program is previous climate changes and what happened and how they dealt with them and how that predicts. Now, historians don't predict, but uh, we're not supposed to. Publishers want us to predict, but um, reminds me of Mark Twain saying that history does not repeat itself. At best, it sometimes rhymes. And so it might be cyclical, but it's never the same. And it's very hard to predict anything from what happened. But we do have Another unusual, which I always thought, okay, the glaciers receded, it got warm, the climate changed, and the, the mammoths and the other big animals died off, and that's what happened. Well, it turns out that there's a lot of research, archaeological research now, uh, saying that about 12,500 BC, they had another flip in the weather. It's called the Younger Dryas, and is named after a, a little alpine flower. The pollens are found in, in, the, in the glaciers. And it interrupted the glacial recession, and the temperatures dropped 4 to 10 degrees in a period of about 20 years. And it, caused the it was caused by the decline in currents bringing warm water from the equator and the greater influx of fresh cold water from the north, north North America to the Atlantic. So we had this uh, gradual receding of the glaciers, 1,000 years or 500 years at least. And then we have this flip where it gets cold again and, and dry. And that's when the mammoths are thriving. 
And, uh, and that's when the, the uh, Clovis culture is discovered as well, 1300, uh, 13,000, 12,000, 12,500, about the same time as the Dryas. And so um, we have the Clovis culture, uh, prehistoric peoples, and uh, named after Clovis, New Mexico, where they made the first discoveries in 1932 of these uh, certain uh, hunter-gatherers that had, uh, you can see their, uh, their spear points here, they had a distinctive uh, style of spear points, and, uh, and they hunted mammoths, giant bison, horses, camels, these are prehistoric horses and prehistoric camels, antelope, sloth, and taper for hundreds of years. So we see the, uh, the illustration here, and they usually hunted in a pack, and this is a pretty good uh, artist depiction of how they could surround. Uh, sometimes they would just chase them off a cliff. I mean, get a whole gang of, and harass the, the mammoth, and you know, a 300 foot fall would pretty well do them in. So the San Pedro River Valley, southeastern Arizona, has about seven mammoth hunter Clovis sites. It is the, the most culture, uh, the Clovis culture sites in all of North America. So all of the experts come to Arizona and we have the world expert, uh, Vance Haynes, got to meet him one time. Uh, Vance Haynes is the expert who writes about the mammoths. And, uh, so around 10,000 BC, they're there a couple thousand years, and around 10,000 BC, the situation reversed itself drastically. And in 10 years, temperatures rose 10 degrees in one decade. So this is the real, uh, what most scientists now, archeologists believe, that the, this is what caused the uh, extinction. And they also feel that it was probably overhunting these, these mammoth hunters were very good at what they did. And uh, Vance Haynes has done this thing with um, looking at the isotopes in the, de in, the, in the teeth of the mammoth to see what they were eating. And he could see there was a certain kind of grass and he could see where they got it. And, uh, and they moved away from the rivers to these meadows where they would get the grass. And what, what Haynes says is he, they, these mammoth hunters figured out where these mammoths were gonna be. They could track them by, oh, this is where they go every year. And so it is believed for a while there, and there are still some experts that think a comet had something to do with it. And they, sh they will show you at Murray Springs Mammoth Site a layer of black mass that is uh, at a certain level around uh, 10,000, BC, but Vance Haynes has done research on that, and this is when the climate warmed again. They started getting a lot of growth, and it's all matted vegetal stuff. The black mass is on top of the mammoth bones, the last of the mammoth bones, so, and there's a lot of other evidence to show that it wasn't a climate, uh, it wasn't a comet, but uh, the, the younger dryas, that period of rapid climate change uh, is a real example of how flighty nature is. One of the writers called it flighty, and it can shift abruptly. And I suppose abruptly would be like that, that mini ice age they had in what, 1300 or something like that. And not the gradual, but where things kind of get bred out, but all of a sudden, uh, most of these, according to the dental work, died of malnutrition towards the end there. So um, it, it makes today's situation even worse because ours is not one of those thousand year gradual changes that's going on now. So moving right along, we'll get to water use because that's the, uh, um, the main uh, topic of, of my talk is water and uh, how it's gonna change and how it has changed. For about 99% of their existence, humans were hunter-gatherers until about 10,000 years ago. And lo and behold, that's about the time the hunter-gatherers are kind of uh, disappearing. The Clovis merges into Folsom culture. And at this point, there is a transitional proto-agricultural stage. And I, I'd only heard about this about 10 years ago, and I, 
proto-agriculture. It's not real agriculture, it's before agriculture. And what they did was they burned off, they, they helped the wild plants. They encouraged wild plants and made the yield better than they would have been just out in the, so they're not just going and gathering what's there. They're going, hey, we like this. Let's see if we can grow some more of that. And uh, so what they did was they burned off unwanted foliage to encourage regrowth. So as things were dying, they burned it off and you get regrowth. They weeded their favorite plants, weeded the other stuff from around them, irrigated, and then replanted things. They take pieces except for the edible part, and they would, they would replant it. And it reminds me of, you know, when you have an avocado seed, well, that's actually planting a seed, but my mother used to uh, put a uh, sweet potato in a, uh, in a jar with toothpicks and jar full of water, and the thing would reroot. So uh, the plant itself will reroot. So we had this going on um, for several hundred years, they were doing that, until they realized how to gather the seeds and plant the seeds and actually do that. Um, and this is a, a mural at the Arizona Historical Society of the various levels of hunter-gatherers all the way up to canals. And I'm gonna have to move my, my screen here so I can see this. Yeah, let's go over here and see if that works. Yeah, so, um, you're moving up to modern times or almost modern times, but the earliest is you've got the, the proto agriculture and then you've got your irrigation ditches. And this is a site out by Morana called Las Capas or the layers because they've got hundreds of years of civilization in that one particular site. So this is what the archeologists would see. It's not terraced in real life. It's they've actually done a cutaway to see this is what they look like in 1300 and this is what they look like back in 1500 BC and so on and so forth. So you've got the gatherers who are just starting to realize they can store things in pits. And uh, so the early farming culture at Las Capas near Morano, 2200 BC to uh, 400 AD. Now there's three or four different ways to say this. BCE, uh, before the Common Era, is pretty popular now, and Common Era for AD. And then as I was doing the research for this, I learned that now they're using, um, oh golly, I've, I've already forgotten it. So we won't go there. We'll just say, we'll stick with BC and, and, uh, and CE, and it'll come to me later. So around 1200 to 800 BC, the San Pedro phase of these, uh, of these, this culture, early farming culture, moved north from Mexico into what is now Arizona and began to grow what we know as the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash. And that's pretty much uh, just about every culture you go to. Uh, I'm originally from Connecticut. I was telling Norm, I was we eight generations in the same house there. And my father couldn't believe he got in a cafeteria once, he ordered succotash, and the lady didn't know what it was. She said, oh, you mean beans and corn? Beans and corn, that's succotash. And so the Yankee Indians, the New England Indians call it succotash, but they're still growing corn, beans, and squash because they work well together too. They, they complement each other. Um, and recent research, and this is the thing, if you go online, you can find things published in 1995 that has irrigation canals much more recent, but the, the most recent studies, and that's desert archaeology, and I know quite a few people over there, uh, are, are finding now from ostracods, uh, these little tiny shrimp that they can find in what used to be the canal, where they can see that the temperature was such and such, and this is when um, they, this particular genus, species, whatever, they can ID a date. It's almost like carbon dating. And so from those prehistoric shrimp, they are finding that the earliest dug canals are 1200 BC. Um, probably the one among the oldest in North America and in the Western hemisphere, the oldest are about 3000 from Northern, Northwestern Peru. So that's, that's a, we're number one kind of asterisk there for the earliest canals. And uh, we used to think that the Hohokam 
in the Phoenix area and down in Tucson were the first ones, but actually this is way before the Holcom showed up. But they are the next folks to come on and they are the master canal builders. And I am so glad I found this map. Uh, I'm assuming that most of you are, are Maricopa County, Phoenix area, but this is, it's really hard to explain how good they were at building irrigation canals. And this is uh, um, around 800, 800 AD, 800 to 1250 is when they're doing this. But uh, you can just see the, the Gila and the salt, you know, that's, uh, that's the, the far end of it on that end. But uh, it's just amazing the, the, uh, the uh, Pueblo Grande, pretty much near the airport. So you've got that, Squaw Peak. And it really gives you uh, an idea of how extensive um, these were. The Hohokam is an Akimel Adam word for those who have gone before. And the homeland of the Hohokam, I really like this, is pretty much the natural habitat of the saguaro cactus. So you go up to New River, and there have been some found up as far as Flagstaff, but generally New River is about as far north as you're gonna see saguaro. If I'm out traveling across the country, as soon as I start to drop down uh, the uh, Black Canyon Highway and I see my first saguaro, I feel like I'm home, even though I'm still 120 miles or 200 miles from Tucson. But as soon as I see a saguaro, I am home. And the, the Holcom go, down into Mexico as the Tohono Atam. So you will see some saguaro, not that far into Mexico, they have other breeds of cactus down there. But uh, this complex uh, system of canals covered hundreds of miles throughout Southern Arizona. And uh, we had them on the, the Santa Cruz River as well. And about 1450, the Salt River Valley was essentially dis, uh, depopulated. And again, lots of theories on that, but uh, keep updating all the time on this. A series of floods in the winter of 1358 to 59. Now, now you can tell they're getting a lot more accurate about these things. Destroyed the canals and turned the fields into untillable mud flats. Uh, and a long drought followed that and followed by more flooding. So again, depending on where you are in Arizona, um, and actually, this there was a 300-year drought all over North America. So you've got the mound builders uh, in Mississippi, and a lot of the other cultures are disappearing about the same time. And they don't actually just disappear. Uh, most our anthropologists feel that they moved to other areas where they could... Uh, when I wrote about the Four Corners area, they could even tell you where they moved from Mesa Verde or from the other places to uh, places that were had more water, were more amenable. And also they were living in a very high population. Um, there's a problem with saline. When you till fields over and over and over, you're gonna get salt. And so that can be a problem. But uh, so they did pretty much by 1450, um, 1350, 1450 is about when they start to disappear. And as I said, about that time, you get the Pima Indians moving in. And so it's, it's felt that they, dis they dispersed into smaller groups, maybe went to the foothills or to smaller villages where they could support themselves on less and less agriculture. And then they started to build again and use the canals again. And so at the same time, in a different location up in Cave Creek, um, some studies and other places as well, uh, Tucson, the Tucson Mountains as well, but dry farming. And this is something that uh, I've always wanted to know more about, and now I do. Uh, sometimes when I, I want to know something about something, I'll make an offer to, to give a talk, and then I'll have to learn it. Dry farming collects and holds runoff and it holds enough runoff from flood rock waters to support the crops. So they're not irrigating directly from the river, they're not living on the river, they're not, uh, they don't have canals, but they're generally in the upper, the lowlands. So it's a little bit higher elevation, 
and they get the runoff from mountain ranges. And in Cave Creek, that's what they're doing. They're getting the runoff from, uh, I guess it's Pinal Mountains and uh, superstitions or what have you. And they've got that water coming down. But the problem with runoff, especially in Tucson, I'm in the Catalina Mountains and it goes whoosh right past me um, in Catalina Foothills. But the idea is to slow it down so that you're not washing away all the topsoil, you're not washing away the crops, but you're slowing it down. So they had a number of things, check dams. Uh, on the slope, they're gonna put a wall of rock and, uh, and that will stop the water and it will stay long enough to soak in. Uh, terraces, this started in, in China um, as early as uh, I think uh, 2000 BC, they started doing that in China where you, you cut steps literally into a st steep slope. And so the water comes down, flop, and then gets to a wall. That's another method they used was bordered gardens. They put rocks around the edge of the garden so that when the water got there, it didn't just sluice right off, it would stop long enough to soak in. So we had, uh, and these check dams and terraces had a dual role. They stopped the water, but they also trapped the soil. And the soil coming from the runoff is bringing silt with it. It's bringing nutrients with it. A lot of the flatlands in Arizona are mostly clay and they're nitrogen poor. And so when you get all this stuff with leaves and everything else in it, uh, you're getting a richer soil. And so you want to trap that debris. And, uh, and that's what the walled gardens and, uh, and the terraces will do. And then the other thing is that many of the canals down in the Phoenix area, these canals, they would um, build their fields at the end of a silt deposit uh, where the river had gone in one direction and then it kind of changed its course. But in that, the old course, there's still a lot of silt from thousands of years of buildup. And the Holocom figured this out and they said, hey, let's plant there and we'll just bring water to it because the soil is good, it's rich. And we'll plant where the silt is. And one time I got a, a flat tire out in uh, Sacaton uh, on, the, on the Gila River and I stepped out of my car and the, the soil was like talcum powder. I mean, you, your foot went about a, an inch down into this powdery, silt, which is like, it's like the Nile. It's just great nutrients. And uh, so they put their, their uh, canals ended at these silt fields. And, uh, but in uh, up in Cave Creek, the study there, they found that the Holcom created their own farmland by diverting the floodwaters and into an area that was rocky and soil wasn't very good at all. And uh, so they created their own farm fields, diverting silt laden flood laden floodwaters onto the fields where they planted rows of bushes to stop the water and spread it slowly. Rather than having it scour the canal bed, they, they put these bushes in the way to figure it, to, to stop the water, to slow it down. And of course, the bushes are also going to grab any of the leaves and debris that come down too, and they're going to wind up on that field. And uh, they were able to do that. The studies found about five fields along Cave Creek that contained 150,000 square meters of imported silts. So they had created their own farmland, a huge amount of farmland, uh, and the the silt had grown from eight from, uh, well, we got 450 years there. Some of it, the silt was, was, tw was two feet deep. So this is really rich farmland. These folks really know what they're doing. And uh, the Toho, Tohono Atam down in the Tucson area and out to Ajo down where I live, they use the same process today. And the anthropologists are disagreed, agree to disagree about whether the, the, the Pima and the Thonatham are descendants of the Holcom. It's pretty well agreed now that, uh, that they very likely are. Uh, and this is another proof of that. They're using the same method to capture the debris. And, uh, and in, in that area, a one inch layer of hummus 
is humus is added to the fields each growing season and it decreases the alkalinity in the soil as well. So um, these, these are methods for improving the farming in a dry area where um, you could wear out the soil and, uh, and they don't have to rotate the crops as much because they don't wear out the nitrogen because they've got new nitrogen coming in every year. And even today in Northern Sonora, there are small, small farms where they plant uh, cottonwood branches and willow branches along the edge of their, their fields. And those grow into trees. And once they grow up a ways, then they take branches and weave them along the ground to make a fence, a, uh, a fence that will stop the flood water. And again, it catches anything that's flooding down and that soil and silt and, and detritus winds up in the field. And they, the, the fences also prevent erosion and scouring. Over and over again, I'll talk about scouring because when you get a flood, that's what happens. It, it just it cuts the, the riverbed deep. And once it gets into that depth, it'll just keep going. I mean, that's where you get the power. And that's when the farms start to, uh, uh, you have trouble, a lot of trouble. And that's what we're, we're ha we have in uh, the 19th century and even today with, with the scouring thing. So probably the, 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 the most um, adept desert farmers are the Hopi and they are using the same techniques, check dams, terraces and bordered gardens and waffle gardens. And I had never heard the term waffle gardens before. And uh, a lot of times when I read these things, I say, oh, people, somebody's gonna ask me, I better look this up. Somebody's gonna ask me, what is a waffle garden? Look at them. A picture says a thousand words. You can see why they call it a waffle garden. It looks like a waffle iron. And that's what they do. They've got the soil that's, you know, you can get it just moist enough to build these little walls. And then when you do get rain or you bring the water to it in your oya, in your clay, jar, then you can water just the area for the plants. You don't, you're not watering the whole world. And, uh, and so that's a very economic way to use water is in these waffle gardens. And uh, so anthropologist Emery Sikakwaptawa uh, tells us about the Hopi way of life, Hopi Vatskawani. It includes every part of Hopi society and culture, kinship, family, religious ceremonies and beliefs, political organization, other concepts, and uh, Hopi Tsvotskwani gives Hopis a strong sense of security in an often troubled world by relating the past to the present and ensuring cooperation with the supernaturals who provide rain, abundant crops, health, and well being. So, Hopi seem a lot calmer than most of us, and that's because of their belief system. And they have a wonderful t-shirt that says, don't worry, be Hopi. And, uh, and so that is, it ties in with their, with their farming methods, which again, lots of uh, praying and doing things the exact right way in harmony with nature. And harmony is, is always, the important part. And when we're out of harmony, that's generally when we have trouble with nature. We're not going with the flow, literally. So um, in, in reading about the Hopi, I learned about Akchin farming. And I thought, well, I know where the Akchin are. They're down by in Maricopa County. Why are the Hopi? That's a term that they use. And it's pretty much the border gardens and uh, Catching the runoff is sometimes called akchin farming. Uh, it's, it's also the, the, the dry farming techniques. Irrigated gardening, and again, as I said, they will bring the water by jar uh, to irrigate. And uh, sand dune fields of beans and fruit tree orchards. And the Spaniards are the one that brought the fruit trees, in particular peach trees. and uh, 
there's all sorts of oral histories about how much the Hopi loved the peach trees. At one point, some of the Hopi, uh, because they were being harassed by Spaniards, went to live in Canyon de Chez, and, uh, and they missed the peach trees so much that uh, one of the women talked her Navajo husband into going back to the Hopi mesas and getting the peach pits. And that's why there's more than 5,000 peach trees in, in Canyon de Chez. They're not, a, well, they are a Navajo thing as well, but at, at one point, probably in the 1880s, a sack of dried peaches would buy you a horse. They were that valuable in those days. So uh, that is something they grew. And um, corn, melons, and squash at the mouth of the, the washes. And again, this is where you put the bushes there. And as the, the, the wash comes down and sort of opens into a delta at the mouth, and then you've got your field right there. So the, as, the, as the flood water loses in strength, and then you've got your bushes to slow it down, um, that, uh, that's where you, you grow your corn, beans, and squash. The men's duties involve tidying the fields, growing, nurturing, and harvesting corn. Women's work includes helping their men in the fields, raising and collecting vegetables and fruit from gardens, taking care of seeds, and handling the byproducts of the harvest season. So it's, it's, a, it's a dual, it's a, a community effort, and it's also um, everybody's involved, all the, the whole family is involved in it. And, uh, and that is the Hopi culture there. Um, then we have Spanish farming and livestock raising. And uh, this is a series, uh, there's a small historic park downtown, well, it's not historic, it's, but a small park just built recently, the, depicting the history of the downtown Tucson area. And this is the panel for the uh, Spanish era. And uh, the Spanish had been overtaken by the Moors from North Africa in about uh, 800, 700, 713 AD, the Moors overran Spain and it took the, Spain, the Spaniards, they call it the Reconquista, the Reconquest, it took them until 1492, the Battle of Granada, to get the Moors back out. So their farming system comes from the Moorish gardens, the Islamic gardens. And, uh, and these are North African desert plants. And so when the Spaniards got to the New World, got to Mexico and to Tucson, they knew how to grow citrus and pomegranates and olives and dates. And that's exactly what you need to grow. And when you don't grow those things, that's when you get into trouble. But when you grow those things, they will grow here. And... Uh, the Spaniards came as a religious colony. Uh, we had several hundred founding the, the, the first colony in Tucson. And uh, the idea was to, it's a, you're gonna convert the natives. The natives are gonna be productive. They're going to, whatever their product is, the silkworms or the, the candles or whatever it is, uh, you're gonna convert the, the natives. They're gonna have a cottage industry then that product goes, a portion of it goes to the king, and you've got sort of a money-making thing that goes out of this. Unfortunately, Tucson was so far out that, and, and so meager in what they could produce, they never really did become uh, a contributor to the Spanish empire. But the other thing was to protect the, the Spanish empire from the Russians and the English who were gonna come in and take their colonies. So, so we were the farthest post north. We were just kind of a toehold just to say, okay, our border is up here. Um, and uh, Father Kino, Father uh, Francisco Yosebe Kino brought at least 1,500 head of livestock to the Tucson area in uh, 17, 1692, 1701, somewhere in there, late 17th, early, early 18th century. And he did it with, he had trained Indians to be cowboys. So the first cowboys in Arizona were Indians. And, uh, and they probably burned the crops to foster their new growth. You, if you go to Mexico, you can still smell the mesquite where they're doing that sort of thing. Uh, but they, they 
the whole southern Arizona was still grassland, even though it was a lot drier. It was grassland until the Spaniards brought in their cattle and the cattle and the sheep and everything else pretty much, and they burned all of the, the dead stuff so that the little new stuff would go up, but the hooves of the cattle and the sheep would destroy the new plants. So eventually you didn't have any grass at all, but the cattle were eating mesquite beans and then they were pooping out the mesquite beans. And so you had a little pellet, a planting pellet as it were, with the manure and the bean and the, the area that had been trampled so there was nothing else there. And by the time you get into the 1800s, um, you have no more grasslands or very little grassland, but you have mesquite thickets. We had uh, somebody tried to re retrace Coronado's route through east eastern Arizona uh, in 1540. And when he tried to go through there in the 1990s, it was so much mesquite, there was no way he could get through it. So uh, that is one way that, uh, that newcomers to the area have upset the balance. Remember, up to this point, they're doing everything to grow the plants that need to grow there, and they're doing it in a way that uses the rainfall that's there. Now we're gonna get to, um, oh, and the, the Spaniards also had, uh, because much of Spain is desert, southern Spain, and of course the Moorish influence, uh, they've got to control their irrigation ditches. They've got to make sure there's enough water and they're living in a community. And as I said, this is a, a religious community, but it's also, we're out on the frontier, everybody's got to help them, help each other. And so they had a man in charge of allotting the amount of water that was in the rivers into the irrigation canals and into uh, your farmland. And around Tucson, there were quite a few acres between what is now downtown Tucson and a mountain, um, seven, eight miles away. And so that man is called a Zanjero, and he is in charge of the ditch, and he is in charge of who gets how much water. And their rule of thumb is the water goes to the land that needs it the most. So evidently, if you get a lot of runoff and your land is pretty wet, you don't get as much water as the guy on the north end of the Tucson Mountains that doesn't get as much water. That is going to change when the Anglos get here. And uh, if you want to see a great movie about how much water you get for your fields, Milagro Beanfield War takes place in New Mexico and it is exactly that. The, some farmers are not getting the water they're supposed to, they're sneaking in, they're diverting water, and that's, that's, water is really valuable, and that's what happens in the area. So, uh, yes, now we've got American farming, and uh, this is Silver Lake on the Santa Cruz River in Tucson in the 1880s. It's about where 29th Street crosses over the freeway and uh, you got Star Pass coming up, but right at the freeway and 29th Street, just south of A Mountain is where uh, this, this man named Lee had a, had a uh, flour mill there and he built a dam, dammed up the Santa Cruz River and made a lake and it became an amusement park and you could go and there was a fancy hotel there and eventually it got kind of disreputable and not, you know, people didn't go there anymore but eventually the dam burst. And when a dam bursts, it scours the riverbed because you've got all of this building up and you've got a depth and you've got some, a flood coming and all this water is rushing. And when it bursts the dam, it scours that, uh, that whole riverbed. And the Santa Cruz River uh, used, to, used to run on the surface and kind of meander in that area I just described out by St. Mary's Hospital and such. And uh, so the Arroyos, when this happened, the, after the United States took possession, minings and railroads came in and created a population explosion and the watershed changed drastically. The Arroyos were carved deeply into the floodplains. They're chopping all the wood uh, for flour mills and for 
construction and that sort of thing. Um, they got the cattle that are trampling the grass so the roots aren't there anymore. They're, they're cutting roads, they're building railroads, and this is cutting into the floodplain. So when there's a flood, you've got a lot of loose dirt and it starts to dig into these arroyos. And uh, uh, the streams went dry, water tables dropped, and the farmers abandoned many fields. And again, uh, the dams and canals did a lot of that because if you dam up the water, then you've got nothing downstream. And eventually when it, when it goes, it's gonna cut. In 1888, Sam Hughes, one of our early, well, I was born in Wales. He's a Welsh immigrant, went to the gold fields and then came to Tucson in 1859. So he's one of our early Anglo entrepreneurs. He dug a small trench off the Santa Cruz River and let the erosion do the rest. He just chopped a hole in the bank and then figured he would let the water runoff dig his own irrigation canal, which it did, but it kept getting deeper and deeper. And then it started eating soil up river, up the Santa Cruz River. And so the joke was that within months, his man-made arroyo arro eroded several miles upstream into the river channel. And of course, it's digging it lower as it goes. And uh, so the joke was Sam Hughes a ditch took a walk back up to Point of Water, which is up by San Vier Mission. And uh, that was pretty much the seminal event, 19, 1888, is when it started, to, the Santa Cruz started to get deeper. Now the Santa Cruz in that same area just happens to be right next to where I, I worked until I got furloughed. That river bed is about 20 feet down and about 30 feet wide. And, uh, and so of course, when it floods, boom, it just scours right through, takes all of the stuff with it, silt and everything, and zoops it right out to Marana, where it has flooded out the town of Marana many times, as late as 1994. So this canal and others, plus large dams that washed out during big floods, caused floodwaters to rush faster, erode riverbanks, damage property, and take lives. So this is, uh, the whole theme of this thing is what happens when we try to mess with nature, and, and that is what happens. Is uh, in a desert, in Arizona especially, um, in a desert, this is, this is what's gonna happen. We have Mormon communities, as advertised, in the spring of 1877, the Hopi, and this is uh, up by, oh, geez, I just, um, Tuba City, uh, Moen Kopi, uh, in Tuba City, and uh, Jacob Hamblin was, was trying to set up, a, he was a pioneer explorer for the Mormons and trying to set up a colony there. And the, in 1877, the Hopi implored Jacob Hamblin to pray for rain as their crops were dying. Possibly through his appeal to grace, rain fell very soon thereafter. And now this was written in, in a, a book called The History of the Mormon Communities, 1923, I believe. Uh, former Governor uh, James McClintock wrote the book. And, uh, and the Mormons did believe that, that, that if they prayed, it could change climate conditions. And uh, so if they kept the right attitude, God would smile on them and they could go to the biggest desert in the world. But if they had the right beliefs and they, and they did things right, more rain would, would arrive. Now, in the 1890s, we had a new theory that land developers were trying to get people out to the West. And so they came up with this theory, the rain follows the plow. And so as you plow, it reorganizes the ions or whatever, and it causes more rain. So yeah, it's a dry area right now, but if you come out and start farming, it's gonna rain more. And that was actually in pamphlets published by the Santa Fe Railroad to get people to immigrate from Europe because, oh yeah, it's dry, but the rain follows the plow. And so one of my professors, Roger Nichols said, I guess you could say the Mormons believe that the rain followed the prayer. And, uh, and so they did come to the north, northeastern Arizona in the 1870s. And man, they had trouble with nature. It's too hard to count how many times floods and dams bursted on the Little Colorado from 1877 
1894 after the eighth dam at St. John's, Arizona, got blown away by a flood. Joseph W. Smith had a dedication to the new dam, and these dams were costing, starting with 5,000, and by 1894, they were paying $60,000 to build a dam. Little Colorado comes along and just blows it right out. He's, and so his prayer at the dedication, oh Lord, we pray this dam may stand, if it be thy will. If not, let thy will be done. The invocation was effective. The eighth dam finally made it. And that area is indeed still a very populous and very productive farming area. The Mormons also in the 1770s went along the Gila River and, uh, and started putting in crops there. And still today, huge cotton crops. Right in the town of Safford, you've got a house a vacant lot with cotton plants, another house, and this is in downtown Safford. So they really, and they didn't believe in ranching. They said, ranching, you're too far apart. Mining was just greed. So they weren't going to do mining. But in ranching, it wasn't a community effort. And Mormonism was all about community effort. So a farming community, you're living close to each other, door to door. It's community effort. And many times when they started these farms, they were communal farms. They were, all the products were shared. It didn't last very long, but they did create community stores where would they make products like brooms and that sort of thing. And those continued to be community owned and operated. Um, and then we go to uh, Tucson, back to Tucson for a lawsuit about water, which reminds me of uh, a saying attributed to Barry Goldwater, I'm sure he probably heard it from his grandfather who came to Arizona in 1859. In Arizona, whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting over. And it certainly is for fighting over. And this is what happened in Tucson. Uh, as I said, the Anglos had chopped down the mesquite for steam powered flour mills and overgrazed the bottomlands, taking away the retaining roots, increasing the runoffs and scouring. The settlers built more in dams to ensure the water supply. And, uh, and it, at, uh, just right next to St. Mary's Road, uh, where it goes into the Tucson Mountains there, uh, just north, south of that, we had Solomon Warner. He had a mill. He built a dam and, uh, for his mill race, flour mill race. And the, 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 the farmers from downstream came to him with shotguns saying, uh, if you don't destroy that dam, we're gonna, we're gonna get rid of you. Because when you put, build a dam, all the farms downstream don't get the water. And uh, I'm not quite sure how that came out, but Warner was still there. And uh, so evidently the law was on his side at this point. But the next group that tried to garner all the water did not come out so easy. Uh, Sam Hughes, Leopoldo Carrillo, who was a, a large landowner, and W.C. Davis leased their lands along, this is the farmland right here, we're looking at the farmland um, that's across probably to the, 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 the Tucson Mountains over here on the, on the far distance, and Tucson itself is going to be about in the middle, and the picture is probably taken from, I mean, those are the Catalinas, I'm sorry. And these are the Tucsons. So we're looking east from the Tucson Mountains, where a mountain is on the west side of Tucson, where the first Spanish mission was. And these are all the fields that were along the Santa Cruz River, fields and orchards since 1771. And before that, there was a huge Tahonoatham agricultural community. So these three men began to lease their farmland to Chinese truck farmers. Now, I find that to be a humorous phrase. They're not growing little GM pickup trucks, and they're not putting dirt in the bed of a pickup truck, but they take the vegetables to market with a truck. And so it's called truck farming, and it is generally for table vegetables, for lettuce, and, uh, and that sort of thing. Until the 1880s, you pretty much ate chili peppers and beans and whatever grew well in this area and you gave up on 
on the delicates, the broccolis, the asparagus, and and the lettuce, and the things that you had to leave back east. Well, the Chinese, after the railroad, after they worked on the railroad, they they started and they tilled more than a hundred acres in this area, and they needed more water. Lettuce takes a lot of water, and so the Spanish law said you water the farms that need the most and you only water on the weekends. Well, the Chinese needed water every day or at least every other day for their vegetables. So the trio of, of landowners, Hughes, Carrillo and Davis formed a water commission and they built a rock and brush fence across the Santa Cruz and apply, farmers had to apply for water. Well, the farmers on the north side, on the far end, they never got their applications accepted. So they took it to court and uh, and they won. So the fence had to be dropped down. But the Chinese still began, came in at night and took water out of the river that was not part of their share and watered their, their truck gardens. Phoenix floods, just a very short on the Phoenix floods. 68, heavy summer floods, 74, the river ransacked the valley for three days. No rain in the summer of 1891. Uh, and they went feast or famine. And then in 1892, Chief Justice Joseph Kibbe made a decision. The water belonged to the land. Up to that point, the canal company built the canal, provided the water, uh, and sold shares of water. Even though they didn't own the land, um, they sold the shares of water. And, uh, and Kibbe said, no, you have to own the land, and then you get a certain share. And he also passed a very old, I believe, English law that says the first people there have the first right to the water. So that's prior appropriation, prior rights, than those who came later. So the early farmers uh, would get the land, uh, get the water for the land. Um, all of these floods brought about the, the Theodore Roosevelt Dam. And uh, it was the first project completed under the Reclamation Act of 1902. It set aside money from public land sales in, in arid states for irrigation projects. We got the first one because McClintock, Governor McClintock had been Major McClintock under Teddy Roosevelt at, uh, in the Spanish-American War in Cuba. So when Teddy got to be president, they call him Teddy's boys. He made, he appointed, a Rough Rider as Territorial Governor of Nevada, a Rough Rider as Territorial Governor of Arizona, and uh, so that's how we got the dam. And uh, so the dam was 357 feet high, took five years to complete. At one point, it was the tallest dam in the nation and one of the first to do hydroelectric power. And uh, we really needed that because in uh, 1917, the Suez Canal is blockaded during World War I, and there's no Egyptian cotton supply. All of a sudden, Arizona is the lead, the world's leading cotton. Cotton is a dry, hot, arid climate. They, they stopped growing citrus. They stopped growing dates. They just grew cotton. And farm property increased profits 800% amount of land farmed, 800%. They need a lot more water and they got it. And uh, so then we've got one little quick one here. I just love this. In, uh, in The Winning of Barbara Worth, this novel by Harold Bell Wright in 1911, he describes what happened in 1904 when land developers decided to chop a hole in the Colorado River to just, uh, create some irrigation ditches for a new land development they had, but they didn't realize that the drop on their irrigation canal was more steep than the actual flow of the river. So the whole Colorado River dumped west into California, uh, went 100 miles, created a 60-foot waterfall, 100 feet wide, and refilled the Salton Sea, an ancient sea which is still kind of there, but it's sort of evaporated and brackish right now. But this is what men can do. One channel grew bigger and bigger and the current grew stronger. The Renegade River flowed its new path for two years before it could be plugged. Railroad track was constructed near the gap and a large wooden trestle was built across the roaring channel. Tons of rocks brought in by railroad cars filled the channel and they finally got the Colorado to go back down into uh, the Gulf of California. Now, I was going to tell you about Robert Forbes, 
a scientist chemist who came here to learn about agriculture. And I will tell you a little bit. He went, uh, he went to, uh, he taught at the U of A. He espoused growing what you should grow here, cotton and dates and that sort of thing. Uh, he had a, a uh, master's from Harvard, went back and got uh, a PhD from uh, UC uh, Riverside. He imported Middle Eastern plants to Arizona. Um, and then he took a job, got a little mad at the president of the university, took a side job in Egypt as a consultant. Oh, I'm still in Egypt, back over here. And once he, he was amazed by what they could do. Um, but he also noticed that the, the goats, sheep, and camels destroyed the soil and overgrazing, semi desert he called them man the desert maker. Because anytime you bring this stuff in and you trample the plants, then you don't get it back. It doesn't come back. Um, so then he got a job as a uh, consultant to Haiti and, uh, and experimented with, with different planting there. And uh, then came back, ran for the Arizona Congress because he was really upset about water use and, and uh, by this time, he's upset about pumping groundwater. They have new electric pumps that are really digging deep and using up the groundwater. So he said, I happen to have traveled in parts of the world where along ancient stream courses, there were once great cities which are now abandoned and in ruins because the water supply that formerly supplied the land around those cities carried salts and it finally salted those lands to the point where they can no longer be used in the cities they left behind are in ruins. So he was really, this is in the 1930s, he's quite before his time. He, uh, he served in the Arizona State Legislature from 1930, for 1948 to 1952. And, uh, and his last term, the Republicans took office and he was 85 years old when he left. So we have floods in Tucson, same story, dams, scouring. Um, and now we have Phoenix, because of their canals, became, I think they produced 20%, or they did 10 years ago, 20% of the, the nation's rose bushes are grown in Phoenix along these canals. Because if you buy property, you get irrigation once or twice a week. So uh, a, a rose bush is a very thirsty plant. <laughs> as you may know, not the kind of thing we should be growing here. We do in Maricopa County grow eight crops of alfalfa per year, and that is a desert crop. So uh, we have water boards that decide who gets how much water, and uh, I'm not gonna get into that, but over pumping groundwater creates cracks, fishes, fissures, and subsidence where the, once the the aquifer is pumped out, it collapses or it cracks. And uh, so the, these uh, thousands of square miles of land leading to millions of dollars in damage of highway bridges, wells, power lines, businesses, and homes. The government is now trying to make sure people follow rules about how much groundwater can be pumped so this problem does not get worse. I was co-author of a fourth grade textbook. So the phrasing is a little different in this part because we're trying to explain to the kids what's going on here and how serious it is. And then we go to the Colorado River, which doesn't run dry in, in, uh, in, at the end. It, it is shunted by the All-American Canal into the Imperial Valley, where they grow about 20% of the nation's winter vegetables. And again, they're growing lettuce and, and cauliflower and things that take up a lot of water. So uh, we now have a fight between the residents and the growers of uh, who gets the water. And um, they also, um, it dumps a lot of salt. And this is mostly from farm irrigation runoff because the Hoover Dam stops a lot of the salt from up, up higher. And uh, so, they started a desalination plant in 1992, $250 million uh, from various agencies, 60 acres designed to clean 73 million gallons of brackish water per day. 
hydrology problems, cost, and political problems, the plant only ran for two months. So it's sitting there. And this is the whole secret to water problems and warming. If we can figure out a way to do desalination, there's plenty of water. It's just not usable water. And when I was working for a water purification magazine, there was people. There were people experimenting in the Middle East with, with, uh, with filters that worked on the tides, where the tide actually pushed the water through a very fine mesh and actually desalinated using the power of the tides to do it. Another one figured out how to get water up a ramp and then drop it through a filter. So again, it takes a lot of force to push water through a filter and desalinate it. But if you can come up with a way that's very efficient, energy efficient, um, that, that is the answer to it. Um, they took a lot of the salt water and shunted it off to a section in Mexico where they now have a bird sanctuary, more than 300 species of birds. And this is salt water but the birds don't seem to mind it. So this is La Cienega de Santa Clara. And I'll end with something that Robert Forbes said, against the slow, relentless trends of nature, there can be little recourse, but against the destructive practices of ignorant and careless peoples threatening the resources of a crowded world. The administrative forces of civilized governments have the power and the responsibility for remedial measures. Forbes died in 1968 when he was uh, almost 101 years old. And uh, his answers are still the answers to what we're doing here. So that's all I got. And I'm probably very late. Oh, I'm not that late. Great. OK. Um, and this is a little thing I wrote. I wrote a book about the Colorado River. And I took this picture down in El Golfo, where uh, the, the uh, the water comes up from uh, the Gulf of California. And so this is the end of my book. Like the Colorado River, there's no ending to this story. Whether the water reaches the sea or a farmer's field, it evaporates, snows down again on the Wind River, mountains, and the Rockies. And here we go again. <laughs>